Hello. First, I would like to thank you for inviting me here, Dimitra. And so I will start. It is not easy to discuss about trauma, especially when traumatic experiences confront us with facts about human nature which are difficult to understand. Excuse me, I haven't started my... Yes, thank you. Yes, here. So... Um. So we we'll start again. So it's not easy to discuss about trauma, especially when traumatic experiences confront us with facts about human nature which are difficult to understand. These facts are easily avoided or neglected. For example, me and my colleagues in a Guinean hospital have recently shown that post-traumatic stress disorder, a common disorder related to trauma, is frequently overlooked. About one-third of patients with depression suffer from current PTSD, which is, in the vast majority of cases, overlooked not only in Greece but worldwide. As a result, people with PTSD are not properly treated. One of many disturbing facts about sexual trauma is the tendency of a traumatized person to repeat the trauma either as victim or as victimizer. Many traumatized people expose themselves seemingly compulsively to situations that are similar to the original trauma. These behavioral reenactments are rarely consciously understood to be related to earlier life experiences. This repetition compulsion that has first been described by Sigmund Freud has received, not surprisingly, little systematic exploration though it is regularly described in the clinical literature. Freud thought that the aim of repetition was to gain mastery, although clinical experience has shown that this is rarely achieved. Instead, repetition causes further suffering for the victims or for people in their surroundings. Authorities like the police or the justice system Unfortunately, some clinicians as well tend to blame victims of sexual assault about exposing themselves repeatedly to sexual violence. By doing so, they are causing, well, just another trauma to these victims of sexual violence. So, uh, on the other hand, mental health professionals seem frustrated of the fact that despite their best efforts, the victim keeps repeating dysfunctional behaviors that lead to revictimization. In this case, the clinician may be, end up being traumatized as well. In behavioral reenactment of the trauma, the self may play these three roles, the role of the victim, the role of the victimizer, or both roles at the same time. Reenactment of victimization is a major cause of violence. Criminals have often been physically or sexually abused as children. In a prospective study of 34 sexually abused boys, Borges and college, college, uh, colleagues <laughs> found a link with drug abuse, juvenile delinquency, and criminal behavior only a few years later. Lewis has extensively studied the association between childhood abuse and subsequent victimization of others. She showed, she, uh, she showed that of 14 juveniles condemned to death for murder in the United States, 12 had been brutally physically abused and five had been sodomized by relatives. In a study of self-mutilating male criminals, Brachi Rita concluded that the constellation of, quote, that the constellation of withdrawal, depressive reaction, hyperactivity, stimulus-seeking behavior, impaired pain reception, and violent aggressive behavior directed at self or others 
may be the consequence of having been reared under conditions of maternal social deprivation. This constellation of symptoms is a common phenomenon among, member, among a member of environment, an environmentally deprived animals." End of quote. Self-destructiveness is another instance of repeating the trauma. Self-destructive acts are common in abused children. Green found, for example, that 41% of his sample of abused children engaged in hat banging, biting, burning, and cutting. In a controlled double-blind study on borderline personality disorder with trauma history, Kessler and colleagues found a highly significant relationship between childhood sexual abuse and various kinds of self-harm later in life, particularly cutting and self-starving. Clinical reports also consistently show that self-mutilators have childhood histories of physical or sexual abuse. Simpson and Porter found a significant association between self-mutilation and other forms of self-destruction, such, such as alcohol, drug abuse, and eating disorders. They sum up the conclusions of many other researchers in stating that, quote, self-destructive activities are related to more primitive behavior patterns originating in painful encounters with hostile caretakers during the first years of life." Quote. Revictimization is a consistent finding. Victims of rape are more likely to be raped, and women who, are, who were physically or sexually abused as children are more likely to be abused as adults. Approximately two of three individuals reporting sexual victimization also reported sexual revictimization. Women with a history of other types of unwanted sexual activities in childhood were three to four times as likely to be raped or otherwise sexually assaulted after the age of 16 years. Research shows that victims of child sexual abuse are at high risk of becoming prostitutes. Russell, in a very careful study of the effects of incest on the life of women, found that few women made a conscious connection between their childhood victimization and their drug abuse, prostitution, and suicide attempts. Whereas 38% of a random sample of women reported incidents of rape or attempted rape after age of 14, 68% of those with a childhood history of interest did. Victims of father-daughter interest were far, four times more likely than on, that non-incest victims to be asked to pose for pornography. So, it is evident that victims of previous sexual abuse or assault are at high risk for subsequent victimization. This raises an interesting question. What makes some victims more vulnerable than others to sexual revictimization? There is roughly speaking one simple answer to that, and it is childhood trauma. In terms of sexual abuse, physical abuse, or family dysfunctions. Besides uh, childhood trauma, of course, the likelihood of sexual revictimization seems to increase with cumulative trauma. Regarding childhood sexual abuse, estimates based on community samples are that child sexual abuse doubles or even triples the risk of sexual revictimization for adult women. And in a random sample of 2,000 children born in Mykoi and Finkelor, uh, in 1995, found that 7.6% were sexually victimized within the past year. According to Rodman and Clams Review in 2001, the more severe the childhood abuse, the more likely the sexual revictimization. Mm. Okay. Type of sexual contact, uh, sexual funding during childhood, doubled the risk of date rape in pre-college women, 
whereas attempted rape or rape in childhood triples the risk of victimization in a large female sample. The relationship to the perpetrator plays also a role. Kessler and Bischke, for example, examined the extent to which peer abuse, non-familial abuse, and incestuous abuse increased the risk for adult victimization. They found that incestuous abuse was associated with the highest <coughs> risk for adult victimization, followed by peer abuse and then non-familial abuse. Maker and colleagues, on the other hand, found that peer abuse was not associated with an increased risk for a victimization. Regarding frequency, Coviol and colleagues found that women who were victimized experienced the greatest fre frequency of victimization in childhood, and women who were victimized were found to have experienced a longer duration of childhood sexual abuse. There is also evidence that the use of force in prior sexual victimization is associated with a greater likelihood of rape victimization. In a sample of a primary black woman, West and colleagues in 2000 found that the use of physical force in childhood sexual abuse predicted sexual revictimization as adults. Coverola and colleagues in 1996 found that women who were revictimized reported more use of force when they were victimized as children compared to women who were only victimized as children and not revictimized as adults. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Childhood physical abuse is also another risk factor. And uh, on the whole, the literature suggests that child physical abuse places an individual who was sexually victimized in an increased risk of revictimization. Some studies have found that it is a combination of child sexual abuse and child physical abuse that places a person at a higher risk for, of revictimization. Regarding family dysfunctions and family factors, uh, family characteristics have been associated with sexual revictimization in several studies. This includes such characteristics as families in which there has been a change in caregivers, families in which a member has a drug or alcohol problem, families where there is conflict, including parental conflict, and the presence of physical abuse, as mentioned above, neglect or mental health problems. Poorer ratings of family functioning have been associated with revictimization, including rating one's family as being less cohesive, less expressive, or higher in control. In conclusion, it seems evident that most of the women who are revictimized have been repeatedly sexually traumatized in childhood, mostly from family members. One has to point out that the above findings should, however, be interpreted with caution in males because revictimization hasn't been thoroughly studied in men. But what do theories say about the possible causes of revictimization and the compulsion to repeat the trauma? Freud stated that, quote, a thing which has not been understood inevitably reappears. Like an unled ghost, it cannot rest until the mystery has been solved and the spell broken, quote. This is reenacted in the relationship between patient and analyst. In fact, it was the ever increasing consideration demanded by this phenomenon called transference and the technical problems it gave rise to which led Freud to complete his theoretical model and introduce the term repetition compulsion in his work Beyond the Pleasure Principle. According to Freud, repetition compulsion is an attempt to master and abreact excessive tensions. Repetitive dreams following mental traumas would especially tend to bear this out. So in repetition compulsion, the unconscious motivation of individuals may be the following. By repeating a traumatic experience, I learn how to cope with it, to gain control of it, and ultimately to make sense of it. Sandra Ferenzi, Anna Freud, Anna Freud, uh, his daughter, and Daniel Lagash addressed an interesting phenomenon called identification with the aggressor. According to Anna Freud, when, some, when someone is faced with an external threat, 
he identifies himself with the aggressor. He may do so either by appropriating the aggressor, the aggression itself, or else by physical or moral emulation of the aggressor, or again by adopting particular symbols of power by which the aggressor is designated. The behavior we observe in is the outcome of a reversal of roles. The aggressed turns aggressor. Ferenzi speaks of identification with the aggressor in a very specific and a little bit different sense. The aggression he has in mind is the sexual attack made by an adult who lives in a world of passion and guilt upon a child. The behavior concerned, described as the consequence of fear, is a total submission to the will of the aggressor. The change brought about in the personality is the interjection of the guilt feelings of the adult. Daniel Lagash, for his part, holds that identification with the aggressor occurs rather at the beginning of life. Within the framework of the conflict of demands between child and adult, the child identifies with the adult whom he adores with omnipotence. This implies that the other person is misperceived, subjugated, even abolished altogether. In identification with the aggressor, possible unconscious constellations may be the following. If I am in control, since my aggressor and I are one and the same, then I am safe because I am the aggressor. aggressor comes from me. Second, that is more uh, in uh, Anna Freud's uh, favor. S uh, second, since my aggressor is so powerful, I will become like him so nobody threatens me again. Uh, no, the first one was according to Lagash and the second uh, according to Anna Freud. Uh, and the third, motiv uh, the third constellation is a little bit more uh, complicated. Uh, it is a uh, uh, it is a consequence of projective identification. The victim perceives a rejected parts of the aggressor as parts of her or his own, and especially blame. The aggressor has no blame, feels no blame feelings, so the child uh, uh, per perceives, interjects these blame feelings. And uh, the child turns against the self, and it says, if I'm not to blame, then I am in, if I am to blame, then I am in control. I am responsible what, for what's happening. So, there are other theories as well, uh, social theories and uh, neuroscience. Sullivan and colleagues have documented that within a particular neonatal time window, infant rodents, mice, will form positive associations with painful stimuli like electric shock or having their tails pinched to a similar extent that they do with positive stimuli, such as being licked or groomed. While much remains to be explored in this domain, it's possible that in early childhood, any kind of strong stimulus facilitates attachment and thus serves as a cue for later approach behavior in mice. In uh, humans, in the absence of a caregiver, children experience extremes of under and over arousal that are physiologically aversive and disorganizing. The availability of a caregiver who can be blindly trusted when their own resources are inadequate is very important in coping with threats. When the persons who are supposed to be the sources of safety and nurturance become simultaneously the sources of danger against which, which protection is needed, children maneuver to establish some safe sense of safety. Instead of turning on their caregivers, they thereby and thereby losing hope for protection, they blame them themselves. They become fearfully and hungrily attached and anxiously obedient. Bowlby calls this a pattern of behavior in which avoidance competes with his desire for proximity and care in which angry behavior is apt to become prominent. The frequency with which abused children repeat aggressive interactions has suggested to Green a link between the compulsion to repeat and the identification with the aggressor, which replaces fear and helplessness with a sense of omnipotence. Raker and colleagues have pointed out that confrontations with violence 
challenges one's most basic assumptions about the self as invulnerable and intrinsically worthy and about the world as orderly and just. After abuse, the victim's view of self and world can never be the same again. It must be reconstructed to incorporate the abuse experience. As human responsibility for the abuse allows feelings of helplessness to be replaced with an illusion of control, as mentioned above. Ironically, victims of rape who blame themselves have a better prognosis than those who do not assume this false responsibility. It allows the locus of control to remain internal and prevent helplessness. Children are even more likely to blame themselves. The child needs to hold on to an image of the parent as good in order to deal with the intensity of fear and rage, which is the effect of the tormenting experiences. Anger directed against the self or others is always a central problem in the life of people who have been violated. Rikers concludes that this acting out is seldom understood by either victims or clinicians as being a repetitive reenactment of real events from the past. So it seems that adults as well as children may develop strong emotional ties with people who intermi intermittently harass, bait and threaten them. Hostages have put up bail for their captors, expressed a wish to marry them or had sexual relationships with them. Abused children often cling to their parents and resist being removed from home. The picture that emerges from the basic affective neurosciences indicate that when animals, included, including, including humans, repeat behaviors, those repetitions are based on early learnings and are fundamentally motivated by the desire to experience pleasure and avoid punishment. This is reminiscent of Freud's pleasure principle, although he maintained that the repetition compulsion is something that goes beyond the pleasure principle. Talking, taking all this into account, it seems evident that any manifestation of seeking pain, destruction or death are ultimately derailments of the basic instinctual, emotional and motivational processes where punishment has been associated with attachment or other rewards, or where some kind of dysregulated reward seeking leads to bad outcomes. Treatment. There are few treatment studies in the literature that specifically addresses, address sexual revictimization. The most extensive research has been on psychoeducation programs to prevent sexual assault in college students. Psychoeducation is an evidence-based therapeutic intervention for patients and their loved ones that provides information and support to better understand and cope with illness. Psychoeducation research on revictimization suggests, however, that these interventions are only appropriate for women who have no history or a less severe history of sexual victimization. Trauma focused psychotherapy and psychotherapy in general. There are many studies supporting the efficiency of trauma focused psychotherapy in sexually abused, in, abused individuals, but very few regarding re victimization. The only published reports to date on the benefits of psychotherapy for populations who are victimized are three pilot studies of Clark and Lieberlin uh, in 1994. They applied a brief intervention of 16 sessions of a cognitive analytic therapy. This therapy was a synthesis of psychoanalytic, cognitive and behavioral approaches. Although this therapy was effective in reducing the severity of women's symptoms, uh, the researchers noted that the model was not as effective in changing their main targeted outcome, which was how they constructed their relationships with men. For some women who were victimized, they, the way in which the woman constructed their child self in relation to their offender was positively correlated with how they constructed their adult self in relation to men in general. This form of therapy was not successful in changing this. Psychoanalytic therapy has almost been founded in grounds of childhood traumatic experiences. Sigmund Freud was, was the first to define the repetition compulsion and to place sexual seduction during childhood 
in the core of hysterical symptom formation, anxiety, and other types of psychopathology. However, it is nowadays very difficult, if not impossible, methodologically, to prove the efficiency of psychoanalytic therapy by means of applying the same concept in a big sample of patients and comparing with other psychotherapies, as contemporary research demands. Since psychoanalytic therapy is of an individualized process, depending highly on the therapist's attitude and the patient's personality. Okay. So it is impossible to apply exactly the same therapeutic model to another patient or demand from other therapists to hold on to another therapist's habits. So, psychoanalysis cannot prove its uh, efficacy, according to moral uh, research. But how are those patients psychoanalytically treated? According to psychoanalytic theory, excuse me, yeah. According to psychoanalytic theory, core aspects forming the compulsion to repeat the trauma are apparent and experienced not only in a patient's life, but also within the therapeutic framework. Traumatized patients tend to repeat the trauma within the therapeutic setting. The therapist draws much information from the patient's life, past or present, by the way the patient actually relates to the therapist. The therapist tries at first to avoid re-traumatizing the patient, but also tries to not be traumatized himself or, her, or herself, or being catched in a position where he or she is a helpless observer like maybe other family members from the past knew but didn't react. This is a very difficult task. One of major tools of succeeding this is interpretation. Instead of giving in to that repetition compulsion, the therapist provides feedback of what the patient is currently doing and tries with the patient to make sense of this behavior. By doing so, the whole traumatic process is transformed into thoughts and words rather than physical acts, providing thus um, an alternate and reparative experience to the patient in terms of getting close to a person without bringing violent conditions from the past back into life and repeat them. Um, I would uh, like to give you a small example of how easily that uh, trauma can be repeated within the therapeutic framework. Uh, imagine that a patient arrives 30 minutes late and demands a full hour of therapy because she or he is feeling unstable at that time. So what do you do? Rejecting this demand may result in the patient feeling mistreated, abandoned, etc. Accepting this demand may lead to a delay of other patient sessions, traumatizing in a way not only other patients, but the therapist as well, since it may lead to substantial work overload. And you end up catched in this situation, feeling that you can do nothing, so then you are a passive observer who can do, sees, but can do nothing. This is the third position in the traumatic constellation. Victim, victimizer, and the helpless observer. And this is only one example of how easily patient and therapist may get trapped in a position where repeating the trauma seems inevitable. So, in conclusion, sexual revictimization is a common occurrence. Child sexual abuse makes both victims and victimizers. Therapy is difficult and has to be individualized. Prevention has to pay attention to family, especially because child sexual abuse happens within family members in most of the times. Thank you.